Today on Context, what makes Canada great? It's more than maple syrup and donuts. And joining us to talk Canadian greatness, hockey hero Paul Henderson, rookie blue actress Missy Peregrim, and Fred Fox, the brother of the Canadian inspiration Terry Fox. Stay tuned. He's been called the ultimate Canadian hockey hero. Paul Anderson scored a goal that was heard around the world and is part of what makes Canada great. Please welcome Paul Henderson back to Context. It's great to have you. Great that you're here. Okay, I don't know, maybe Canada is great because we keep seeing your 1972 goal over and over again, but we've got to show it one more time. Take a look, everybody. And the Grenoye has it on that wing. Here's a shot. Henderson made a wild stab for it and fell. Here's another shot right by the door. All right, how do you feel watching that back? The thing that disturbs me, I scored seven goals. Six of them were really nice. That was the only garbage goal I scored. We've been watching that thing for 45 <laughs> years. So <laughs> it doesn't do much for my ego, I'll tell you All that. Right. Okay, but let's, we're here to talk about Canada being a great place. And why is it that hockey so defines our national identity? <clears throat> I really think it's in our DNA. As a kid growing up, I mean, I just couldn't wait to get on the ice. And uh, people that don't play the game, I'm, some of the biggest fans we have in the world are elderly woman, women in their 70s and 80s that they'll come up to me, oh, Paul, you were one of my <laughs> favorites. And so I just think it's a, it's a part of our fiber, maybe because of our uh, climate or those kind of things, but it just seems that it's almost a religion, I think. Okay, well, I'm glad you brought up religion because we do want to talk about a national identity that has a spiritual dimension. How did you develop your faith in God? Well, it was, I was a late starter. I, I really, growing up, I really didn't have much interest at all, but Mel Stevens up at the Teen Ranch knocked on my door one day and encouraged me to look at uh, the spiritual side of life, and I spent almost two years with him. Uh, asking a lot of questions. I started off very skeptical. I thought Christians were a bunch of people that couldn't make it. If you couldn't make it in life, then you got to get God in your side. And Because you'd already made it in hockey, and that only <clears throat> after hockey you oh, started yes, asking this is, the yeah. God questions. I started working with him in the winter of 73, after the 72 series, because I had everything. I had the greatest wife in the world. I had a family. I loved playing hockey, but I, I just knew there was something missing down here. I, I didn't have a clue what it was until... <clears throat> Mel spent those two years trying to convince me that God was who he said he was, that he loved me, loved me so much he died for me and invited me to have a relationship with him. And so actually it's going to be March 12th, 1975, which uh, was the day I gave my life to the Lord, which is Mel's birthday. I didn't know it at the time, but that started a, a wonderful process. And then I had some couple of really great mentors that really build a foundation and taught me how to go deep and get to know the Lord in a deep way. I like to say you went from hockey to holy, and I cannot count how many pulpits you have been in. You've been in church after church, breakfast after breakfast, these spiritual breakfasts. Um, what did you learn about people's spiritual discoveries in Canada? <laughs> There's a hunger there. I think that with myself, like I wasn't going to go to church. And I had a, a, a wrong concept of who God was. I needed to see somebody that really loved the Lord and I could see it in his eyes and feel it. And that was Mel Stevens. And then I needed another successful businessman, John Bradford, <clears throat> that lived the life on a day-to-day -day basis. And so I, I needed to see some real life examples of that. And they absolutely influenced my life and I wanted to become like them. And, uh, and then when you start to get to know the Lord, you know, he starts changing you from the inside out. He starts doing things that I knew that I could never do, and I knew that he had to be real. Family makes Canada great. This is like we're looking on these themes that make Canada great. Yep. You guys do marriage seminars. You oh, I love Elder. doing okay, that. What have you learned about Canadian marriages and what they need to be great? <laughs> well, we just finished one down in Niagara in the Lake this past weekend, and it, it, and it's tragic what's going on out there. People start off so much in love and everything that can go wrong 
Pornography is a terrible problem today. And now it's even more, 30% of the pornography is bought by women. Can you believe that? <clears throat> I can, I can. And, so and what it, makes it great? Well, how, do, how do you repair it all? What? Well, we give them a plan. <clears throat> and Eleanor and I talk about the best. Smart, I mean, Eleanor and I had a good marriage. And, and I don't think we'd, if we'd have never become Christians, I, I really believe that we'd have never been divorced. But what we tell people that what we've endured, what we have done is we've invited the Lord into our lives and into our marriage. And so we listen. I mean, the Bible talks about how to be a great husband, how to be a great wife, and, mm -hmm. and uh, how you just you love each other unconditionally. And, and when you have a game plan, I think what we do is we give people hope. We give them, we give them hope that they can make this work, and we show them how to do it. And we show them how to get out of the predicaments they are. I mean, marriage is tough. You've been married. You know how tough it is. It doesn't. <laughs> but I think that's what... I, I, God lets us go through the tough times because when you go through the tough times, I think that really draws you together. Eleanor's had terrible health problems since 1983, and of course, I've got a battle now with this cancer, but we would say we've been married over 50 years, and we think we're in the best space we've ever been in our life, that's and that's fabulous. a gift from God. Fabulous, and such a gift strong family life can be to Canada. Another gift we have in our country that makes us great is the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. Mm -hmm. And now we have the freedom to choose when we will set our death. Assisted dying is legal. Yep. You've, um, you've had this terrible cancer. You've known what it is to have terrible pain. You still are living this cancer. Will you want assisted suicide? Is that a great right for Canadians to have? <clears throat> Personally, and uh, I don't think it is. Like I had, I, I love life. I, I, I would not even think about doing that. But you're going to be in pain one day. <clears throat> oh, that's right. But I'm not at this point. And so I'll make that decision at that point. But at this point, I, I trust God implicitly with everything. Even with dying? I, even with dying. I know I'm going to die someday. And, and so I'm leaving that up to him. I, I, at this point in my life, uh, um, I just try to get up in the morning. Okay, Lord, I don't care what happens. I'm not going to have a bad day. I'm going to trust you. You tell me not to worry. You, turn, you tell me not to be fearful. And the wonderful thing about faith, when I found out that I had cancer and it was stage four, Eleanor almost fell off the chair, I, I, I can honestly tell you, I've never had any angst whatsoever. I know where I'm going. And I've already started my eternal life. And so the day I finish here, I'm going to be with the Lord. And so, and I'm going to leave that up to him. When I look over my shoulder, I should have been dead five or six different times. And I can just see where... Well, heart attack, you know, all those type of things, and I'm still here. And so I am fully going to leave it up to God. Okay, I think there's going to be hockey in heaven. I want to close this <laughs> with um, just uh, a couple of quick 10-second rounds, okay? Sure. This, is, this is from your book, um, How Hockey Explains Canada. <clears throat> okay, so 10-second round. How does hockey define Canadian culture? It's in our, it's just like I said, it's in our DNA. It's oh. everywhere. You can't, get a, you can't get away without it. We talk about it, the sports, everything. It's okay, it. which town or city invented the game in Canada? Well, <clears throat> there's four or five that claim, uh, but I'll go with Kingston because John Cherry says, but Windsor, Dartmouth. But... And the former prime minister says it's Montreal. Okay, hockey and modern dentistry. Well, look at it. I mean, you go to Sudbury or uh, Timmins and no man has got teeth. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. How does hockey explain Western alienation? Well, Westerners, they, they, they're they tough. They're rugged. Uh, you know, they play hockey and it's 40 below and everything like that. And they, and they, I, I think they, they just, there's a different, there's a difference to them out there because they're stubborn as a knox, but man, are they good hockey players. <laughs> okay. Why do we take the Stanley Cup to Kandahar? Any place you find Canadians, you're going to find hockey. They'll play it in the sand. They'll play everywhere. And obviously, we've got a lot of people over there that play hockey. And they, a lot of hockey players going over. Unfortunately, I've, I've been invited a couple of times, wow. but couldn't make it. All right. Well, Paul Henderson, Canadian hockey hero, thank you for telling us about what makes Canada great. Thank you. Thank you. Missy Peregrim starred in one of Canada's most successful TV series exports ever, Rookie Blue, the life of first responders learning on the job. Welcome, Missy Peregrim, to Context, everybody.
Missy, you're joining us in LA, but tell us where you describe home and what's so great about it. Ooh, home is always Canada to me. My family's in Vancouver, so until I have a family of my own, I'm going to say that's probably home for me, always. And I love Vancouver for the scenery. I love it because my family's there, obviously, so I go there all the time. Uh, and there's just a... I don't know if it's home. It probably is both home and Canada, but I always feel uh, a warmth and security every time I, I go back there. I love it. Well, you know, you were such a compelling star for all 74 episodes of Rookie Blue, but you actually had a real education from um, Canadian police, Canadian SWAT teams. What did you learn about Canada's great first responders? Um, I would just say that I was always moved by how much they really care about people. Um, they're really, really good people. I enjoyed my time with them. Uh, every time we got to work with them, we had them on set all the time because we had to shut down streets. So every time we were uh, not at the studio, they were with us and we had real SWAT team members. Every time you see them in the show, they're real. And we had just fascinating conversation. I can't believe the risk they take to protect us. And I'm humbled by the work that they do. And you felt touched that they also liked the fact that that women needed to be part of the force. They were really passionate about that. What did you learn about that? Yeah, um, so every time I take a job, I think I can do it for real. And that's a total lie. There's no way I can. But, you know, I worked on this one movie as a gymnast, and I was like, yeah, I'm going to be an Olympian. And that didn't happen. And now I thought I could be a police officer. And uh, so, But I was like, ah, there's no way I'd be able to do it. I'm too emotional. I'm too sensitive. I take everything on probably empathetic to a fault. And they said that that's actually what they love about uh, females being a part of the team because we are able to relate to people and we actually bring something to the table that they're unable to do in the same way. And so they value that and that excited me. So they tried to recruit me, which I was <laughs> but... Okay. <laughs> well, Rookie Blue was loud on and loud and proud on Canadianisms. You didn't hide anything about this being shot in Toronto. Um, yeah. What are some of the qualities that make you proud of being Canadian? Ooh, I got to tell you, we have a great reputation. So much so that all of my friends who are not Canadian lie and say they are every time they're traveling. Um, <laughs> because it makes it easier on them. They put the Canadian flag on their backpacks and... Uh, I, I love the reputation that we have. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm proud of us. I'm so proud to be Canadian. Always have been. I like that we're polite. I don't care how much they make fun of us for that. I like that we, I think are a compassionate country. Um, I think I, the values that I have come from being in Canada. And I think that that's a pleasure. And, you know, we obviously don't get to choose where we're born, but we can pass that on to other places in the world because we have that privilege. You did grow up in a Canadian faith-filled home. How did those values affect who you are? Jeez, deeply, I guess. Um, you know, when you're younger and you have a faith, it's more because mom and dad tell you you have to go to church twice. And also my dad's a pastor, so we spent a lot of time in the church. Um, but as you get older, it really becomes a very personal thing. And uh, I think it's been a grounding force for me because in this industry, it's really difficult. You're rejected all the time. 95% uh, of the time I'd say. And even when you do get a job, uh, there's a lot of people trying to tell you who to be and how to act. And so you're constantly having to stand your ground. And sometimes you don't even know who you are enough to do that. And I am, I, I'm really grateful that my identity isn't in fame or money. Um, in beauty and all these things, it's, it's really in Christ. And that's something that's been grown though. That's not something that I've always felt or been confident in. It's just something that I've been able to mature into and it's a gift. So how does that identity in Christ, your walk with Jesus, equip you to be, uh, you know, surviving in your industry and to be a great actress? We're so proud of you being Canadian, huh. Missy. Thank you. Um, I don't know if it really relates to any one thing. I I didn't know I was going to be an actress. I, I never really wanted to do this, and I'm always thinking about other things I can do. I just think that it's people. You know, I really value people and care about that. And um, so, regardless of my position or where I'm living, what job I'm in, I really try to be 
people first and uh, care about people's hearts and apply the values that I have and work towards uh, being the person that I really would like other people to be towards me. So whether that's working or not, I don't know, but I'm definitely trying. <laughs> oh, well, Missy Peregrim, uh, thank you for reminding us just what it is to be a great Canadian, even though you're living in LA and you're working and representing us there. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Missy Peregrim, Canadian actress and star of Rookie Blue, a star of Heroes, thank you for joining us from Los Angeles. Thank you. Coming up, the Terry Fox story and Canadian greatness. The story of Terry Fox and his Marathon of Hope is known worldwide. It's a symbol of Canadian toughness, compassion, and battling the odds. Terry's older brother, Fred Fox, joins us today from Vancouver. Fred, welcome to Context. Well, thank you very much. It's great to, uh, to be with you today. Fred, your brother's life has inspired millions of us. He lived out that Canadian grit and compassion for others in his fight against cancer. What has been the impact of the Marathon of Hope on your own life? Well, it, it was just uh, such an amazing spring and summer, not really knowing when we, when our family, mom and dad, and we, we went with Terry and Doug to the Vancouver airport and sent them off to Newfoundland. We had no idea uh, what to expect and what they were going to meet. And uh, of course it was slow going and, and it was all about Terry wanting to make a difference and, and not knowing really what kind of an impact he would be able to have. And, and as things, as Terry made his way across uh, Newfoundland through the maritime provinces, through uh, Quebec and then into Ontario, the momentum built and uh, it was such a great uh, time to be with Terry uh, a couple of times during the Marathon of Hope and, and to see that people were uh, w believed what he wanted to do and, and, and believed that uh, he was going to be able to make a difference and, and saw through his honesty and his integrity that um, he wasn't doing this for any personal gain but truly to change the, the outcomes of cancer uh, in the future. Well, how do you think Terry modeled Canadian courage and resilience to the world. I mean, he was just uh, 22. Um, how, how did he model it for us all? Well, I think that, you know, that I think uh, Canadians are known as being uh, passionate and uh, humanitarians, uh, hard workers. Uh, you know, we, we live in a climate that we have to be hardy. And I think they see Terry as though all those things about integrity and honesty and, and making a difference. And, uh, you know, I've had a chance uh, this time last year, I was in uh, Abu Dhabi. And, and, you know, and the United Emirates and for the Terry Fox run there. And we visited Daryl and I, my brother Daryl and I visited schools there. And he, this is kids from all over the world uh, going to school there. And they knew Terry as, as any, any young student here in Canada. And um, uh, it, were inspired by what Terry did. Uh, again, working as hard as he could, uh, never giving up, having that uh, uh, never give up attitude that uh, so many Canadians have. Yeah, and he had this great passion, a dollar from each Canadian. He more than met that. How does Terry's legacy live on every day now in the work of the Terry Fox Foundation and the ongoing fundraising and cancer research you've done? Well, you bet. Uh... You know, I, I, I probably wouldn't be standing here today if it wasn't for the so many thousands of volunteers and, and uh, run organizers, vol uh, uh, participants, donors who give every year to the Terry Fox Run. I think we have close to 9,000 schools in Canada, 700 communities in Canada that have Terry Fox Runs. And, and the money that's been raised, over $750 million since 1980, um, has truly made a difference. Uh, our family, our, the people who work for the Terry Fox Foundation and Research Institute, every day get a chance to meet people who have benefited from the monies that are raised. Uh, cancer research, since Terry was diagnosed in 1977, uh, here in Canada has come such a long ways and uh, we get a chance to meet people almost every day or hear their stories that uh, they truly believe. If it wasn't for what Terry did in 1980, they may not be alive today. So the legacy is truly uh, stronger than it ever was before. 
Yeah, and I love it how Isidore Sharp partnered with your family. So many things. What did Terry love about Canada? Ah, geez, you know, I, you know, uh, as kids, we, we loved the opportunity to be able to go anywhere we wanted and, and to play and to explore, uh, to be part in. Uh, Terry loved to play sports, so uh, although, you know, hockey is so well known here in Canada, we did, uh, we played other sports, and, but Terry just loved, uh, Terry loved the opportunity to uh, represent his province in different athletic in, uh, endeavors after he was diagnosed with cancer with, as an amputee, and he just loved to be able to travel across the country, uh, visit people from coast to coast, and although you know in many ways we're different, we're all united and, and uh, believe the same thing. So Terry, Terry was so proud to be Canadian and uh, um, and so proud to know that uh, the things that he believed in and that were he felt were important uh, that gets that gets reflected to so many young people around the world. Okay, not everyone knows this, but Terry was open about his faith as a Christian and how that strengthened him. How did Terry's trust in Jesus inspire him during his life and struggle? You know, um, being a Christian was so important to Terry. Uh, as children growing up, um, you know, we, we weren't um, maybe introduced to uh, going to church all the time. We went to Sunday school during the summer and Bible school, and, but it wasn't something that we were doing every day. And after Terry was diagnosed with cancer and, and meeting new people, uh, being a Christian was so important to him. And it gave him uh, later on, and after he was forced to come back from uh, Thunder Bay, being forced to uh, end his Marathon of Hope because of the return of cancer, uh, Terry's faith gave him so much uh, strength, so much belief in the fact that uh, even though he didn't finish running the miles, he knew that he was probably put on this earth for a purpose. Um, in his short life, he accomplished so much more than most of us hope to in our lifetime. And it gave Terry strength in knowing that, um, you know, although he was going to pass away, that he was going to somewhere better and that he would be leaving behind uh, a better world when it came to cancer research. And I have no doubt he cheers you on, Fred, in the work now. So what do you think the next chapter in Terry's legacy of advancing cancer research will be for us? You know, ultimately, um, Terry always hoped that uh, we would find that ultimate cure for, for cancer. And uh, although many, many um, advances have been made, I think uh, doctors are telling us, you know, cancer may not be, different cancers may be cured, but, but many will be just treatable like other diseases with, with, uh, with uh, prescription drugs and that kind of thing. So, um, you know, people are living longer today, surviving their cancers, and, and, and we know as money is being raised, um, not only by the Terry Fox Foundation, but other organizations, um, cancer research will grow and get better. Um, and the researchers that we have in this country are doing a fantastic job and they will continue to do that uh, throughout the years. Fred Fox from the Terry Fox Foundation, thank you very much. Thank you, Lorna, great, thank you. Sheldon, over to you now with a question for our audience at home. Well, thank you so much, Lorna. There is much to love about Canada. So we want to hear what you think. Our question for you is simple. What do you think makes Canada great? Give us your thoughts by any of the means you see on the screen. You can also call us at 1-800-215-4913. Write to us by email at comments at contextwithlorna.com and find us on Facebook and Twitter as well at Context TV. Well, when we looked at this topic of what makes Canada great, the answer is actually in the mirror. We all make Canada a great place. But we had to ask today, what is the fuel that makes people great? And I loved hearing the spiritual depth on today's program of great Canadians who bring their belief in God to their iconic Canadian lives. And we'll sign off with the idea that as you understand your purpose and your connection to God, you find what it takes to go beyond yourself. There are challenges in life that require a deeper resolve, a kinder spirit, a wiser way than can be sourced naturally. 
Inspiration from God is what helps make people great. Even supernatural trust that God equips us for the highs and lows of what life can throw at us. The Canadian tradition of believing in Jesus Christ goes back a long way and it is part of what makes this country great. So if you need a reboot in that direction, drop us a line, we'll reply and give you some tips. There is no better way to begin than by understanding the spiritual roots of why we exist and how to have a life that is connected to God. For all of us at Context, I'm Lorna Duick. Thank you for watching and join us next week as we explore life beyond the headlines. Thank you. news for you online at Context. Now these are the stories you won't see on TV, but it's a daily delivery for your phone, iPad, or computer. Let's take a look. Well, whether you believe in the concept of soulmates or not, we have one story for you by our own Molly Thomas. Now she shares the love story of her 100-year-old unmarried grandmother on this blog. Well, when a tragic car accident took the lives of a taxi driver and his passenger in Calgary, the two families came together to mourn and support one another. Now, Context spoke with Caitlin Lavallee, who lost her sister in the accident. Right then and there, we just knew, like, we need to help them, we need to be in relationship with them. The only way we're going to get through is by being each other's family and support system. And when it comes to dealing with mental illness sometimes, medication and therapy just aren't enough. Well, Professor John Stackhouse blogs on the need for spiritual and ethical help as well. Well, you can find all of that and more online at contextwithlorna.com.